Welcome to today's lecture. Today we're going to continue our discussion of various deployments of uh, differential privacy. So we're going to cover a few things today. Um, roughly there'll be, I guess, three parts. The first one we'll be talking about uh, a deployment involving Google. It, okay, maybe I'm cheating a bit here. It's not 100% clear to me whether they deployed this or not. Um, it's kind of more of a systems paper, but um, it's important enough that I'll cover it nonetheless. So the first one is a Google sort of deployment of uh, which um, led to a new model of differential privacy known as shuffled privacy. The next is that we'll look a little bit at a uh, LinkedIn deployment uh, involving their uh, two things. One is an advertiser's uh, uh, API, as well as a recent application to seeing job growth uh, during the last several months. And um, we'll conclude just with a few more uh, data releases done one by Google on COVID uh, location patterns, as well as uh, a Facebook URL data set, which was also protected via differential privacy. But so like I said, we're gonna start with Google and talk a little bit about shuffled uh, privacy. And so this type of model of uh, differential privacy was kind of introduced in this paper called uh, Proclo. So uh, it doesn't really cover the full differentially private uh, model as you know it's formalized in some later papers, but this at least sets the stage in terms of uh, you know a real system that actually came out before the privacy model was introduced. So since this is a systems paper and the focus is a bit different from the type of stuff we've been talking about in this class, I won't really go too deep into it, but I just want to at least try to get a picture of the uh, architecture and what exactly is going on here um, and why in particular they need it. So recall from the last lecture, we talked about how the fact that Google already has a uh, rapport, which is a very nice uh, differentially private system, but it's not really, uh, there, there's some drawbacks with it. In particular, um, they point out the fact that it really requires a lot of uh, data. Um, let's, let's, they give a, some number here about how much data um, rapport takes for certain cases. So let's, uh, let's, let's talk about a concrete, they, since it's a systems uh, paper, they talk about a very specific systems type uh, query that they found an important one to do. So let's see, consider the task of determining which system APIs are which used by which software applications. So basically you have a different bunch of different programs and they use different APIs that belong to the computer and you wanna figure out which ones use which. Uh, and this can be important, for example, if you uh, see that, uh, some system APIs are being used a lot, then maybe you'll want to continue support for them. If other ones are not being used at all, maybe it's uh, time to deprecate uh, support for those uh, if you're the API, uh, you're, you're the one who runs these system APIs. So yeah, they say some of the potential benefits is the detection of seldom used APIs, cataloging of applications still using old and legacy APIs, um, stuff like that. It's important to know which system APIs are being used by which applications. So they motivate privacy once again. We're not going to get too much into that because it's like, well, perhaps you should see the uh, privacy implications here. Um, but okay, so the, the, I mentioned this just because they give specifically, you know, what's, what's bad about rapport and what's bad about local differentially private mechanisms? Well, the bad thing about these mechanisms and the bad thing about rapport is that local differential privacy requires a huge amount of data. Um, yeah, uh, let, they, they give some specific numbers just to like uh, let you get a feel for the magnitude of how much data is needed. Um, essentially, for example, one, one example they give is suppose you just had a moderate number of uh, um, applications. So you have, say, a thousand applications and there's a hundred APIs and you want to try to measure you know, which apps use which APIs and how many times they use them, et cetera. Well, taking this uh, product, uh, this is sort of 100,000 app times API pairs, which leads to a sort of domain in terms of the number of con com uh, combinations of 100,000. Now, the thing is, how much, uh, how much data do you need in order to do that? Well, they say basically, uh, you know, this is how much you need, an order of magnitude more than 100,000 squared, and that would need, need reports from 1 trillion individual users. So clearly, if you had this sort of fairly modest uh, use case, where you, which you want to try and understand, you would need, uh, you know, 
more users than exist on Earth right now. So it's clear that this is kind of more data that would ever be possible uh, if you wanted to answer this type of question with local differential privacy. So what they, what they try to do is essentially introduce a new uh, type of uh, architecture which can uh, handle this sort of uh, case uh, without you know, uh, paying the same type of cost in terms of the amount of data they require. So this, this is a little bit more heuristic in terms of the type of privacy that they give in this paper in certain senses. Um, why, why do I say that? Uh, I mean, they still provide differential privacy later, but it kind of uh, does not provide... My, my understanding of at least the way they describe it here is that they don't provide the same type of uh, strong... Uh, local differential privacy, but they provide some types of uh, privacy which are kind of generally considered sufficient in industry. Um, for example, appropriate uh, anonymization and uh, mixing up of data. That's kind of seen as to be what's sort of conventionally accepted, and then combining that with uh, differential, formal differential privacy guarantees for the um, sort of third step. So I'm getting a bit ahead of myself talking about different steps, so let's maybe talk about uh, you know, the breakdown of what the architecture at a high level looks like. Um, and they call it ESA, ESA, for encode, shuffle, and analyze. Uh, I'm not going to get into, like, the, they, these are kind of very general type of uh, general uh, functionality that are supported here. But in particular, like, you can, uh, let, let me try to just describe it at a high level what happens. Uh, essentially, first is that each individual, each user, has their own data, and they do some sort of uh, encoding of their data. For example, uh, when we were looking at rapport or local differential privacy, this encoding E could just be uh, a local differentially private uh, modification of their data. So just encode it using LDP. Um, yeah, essentially each user prepares their own data in order to feed it into the system. So then what happens is they sort of all feed their data into the system, the second step, which is called the shuffle stage. Now what the shuffler does, this is kind of more well-defined. Uh, essentially all it does is discards all sort of, uh, you know, timing data, IPs, everything like that, and just shuffle these uniformly at random in order to make sure essentially whoever's on the other side of the shuffler cannot... Uh, cannot, uh, you know, tell which of these messages came from who. So, you know, A, B, and C, uh, they're kind of shuffled around and they might, they're, they're sort of disassociated from who they came from. Uh, yeah, that's what the shuffler does. Um, and then the last step is the analyze step. So analyze essentially takes these uh, shuffled uh, messages and based on the shuffled messages, decodes whatever interesting information was there in the first place. So yeah, very, it's, a, it's sort of very simple. Um, the, the main sort of key thing that makes this special, though, you should picture is the uh, shuffling here. The shuffling is kind of the thing that makes this unique and uh, what kind of is different. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say in this paper, the shuffling is done a little bit heuristically, just sort of feeling that... Uh, you know, disassociating which uh, data came from which individuals is a good privacy thing, but as we'll see in the next uh, in the next sort of component, sort of the follow-ups to this paper, um, that this is actually the very crucial uh, a crucial component uh, in terms of you know guaranteeing differential privacy and a strong notion of differential privacy, as we'll see. So yeah, this is this is like I said, a systems paper, so they have these three stages, and they kind of talk about. Uh, various things, uh, like various systems level considerations for the most part. You know, what sort of trust model we have, who you can trust, when you can trust the uh, shuffler, when you can trust the analyzer, when you can trust the encoder, etc., etc. There's different types of attacks in different types of settings. Talked a bit about privacy guarantees. Not a lot that I want to focus on here. Um, let's see, what, what a, there, there's one thing I want to focus on here in particular, which is... Okay, we talked about, you know, encoding. We understand how a user would encode their data. They literally just, uh, you know, in encode their data, say, by themselves. Uh, this is something a user can do. And we understand the analyzer. The analyzer would be, say, Google or whoever 
um, whoever's looking at the sort of shuffle data. But the main question here is what about the shuffler that we have in the middle here? Who is the shuffler and how do we sort of do this? Like, what, how, you know, does Google shuffle your data? Do you trust them to do that? Um, are the users shuffling the data and how would they do that? So the implementation of the shuffler is not quite an obvious uh, primitive. How do, we, how do we shuffle things? And in order to implement this shuffling process, there's kind of, uh, you know, as, as a theorist, one might think that, oh, there's just uh, some primitive that shuffles it, uh, just, just believe it exists. But of course, since they actually want to implement this, they have to actually talk about how this is done. So there's kind of two different ways uh, of, uh, of actually implementing this sort of thing. And one is uh, using what's known as trustworthy hardware. So Intel, who I'm sure many of you know as a chip manufacturer, uh, they have very specific uh, chips which are uh, basically made for privacy and making sure uh, certain uh, operations can be performed uh, privately. Basically, no one looking can, uh, can basically figure out what's going on inside of this. And this is what's known as Intel SGX. So yeah, th this is sort of a hardware solution in order to do computations privately. Now, there's some criticisms of this, which we can get into some other time, but uh, you know, some people are worried, how, how can you trust Intel? How can you trust that they did this properly? And uh, you know, all the time, there's sort of, sorts of uh, you know, leaks and uh, security violations. For example, you might have heard of uh, Spectre like a couple of years ago. But at its core, imagine, there, the, all I want to get across is that there are some types of hardware which are at least intended and trusted uh, by some to be able to do these types of, uh, uh, you know, private uh, computations, and in particular, uh, supporting a type of uh, what's known as oblivious shuffling using this type of SGX enclave, it's called an enclave, because within this enclave, nobody else from outside can really see what's going on inside. So yeah, this paper goes into a lot of detail about uh, how to do perhaps these shufflings uh, in this uh, enclave and stuff like this and gives a few different algorithms, which are kind of nice. And if you're curious, I'd recommend checking it out. Um, so yeah, this is a very hardware-based solution. Um, yeah, on the other hand, another type of approach besides, uh, so that, that's one thing, one way to do this uh, shuffler is to use a specific uh, hardware, which is trusted uh, and is provably able to do the sorts of uh, privacy-preserving computations. Another approach is to use uh, some, what's known as sort of secret sharing cryptography, and this is related to what's known as mixnets. Uh, this is not something that we'll get into again uh, today, but the main idea is essentially there's a way of, uh, uh, there's a way of essentially having a group of uh, individuals be able to do a uniformly random shuffle in a cryptographically secure way. Uh, you know, there, there's some talk here about secret sharing and uh, yeah, well, I, I'm not going to get into this too much, but the idea is that essentially, you, yeah, we'll, we'll not get into that. We'll just say that there's a way for several individuals to uniform, uniquely uh, shuffle their, or sorry, uniformly and randomly shuffle their data so that uh, it's kind of mixed up as to which data began, uh, came from who. So. Yeah, well, not uh, you can read up more about this if you're curious, but those are kind of the two main ways, uh, at least that uh, I'm familiar with in terms of how to do the shuffling, either via sort of uh, new hardware or via cryptographic algorithms like that. So yeah, they have some experiments of this sort of thing, and you know, we'll, listen, we'll not get into the details of uh, you know precisely what these numbers mean, but just sort of showing the number of uh, unique words that can be recovered in some sort of data set. They show that this line at the bottom is a uh, rapport, say, uh, with a big enough data set of uh, even, even, sorry, with a yeah, data set of up to, let's say, 10 million, can only recover maybe 240 unique words, even if there's 91,000 unique words. But um, this, their system, Proclo, with the sort of similar differential privacy guarantee, uh, can recover more like 20 or 30,000 of these words. So a lot more words can be recovered in this case. So 
yeah, I don't think there's anything else I want to talk about in this paper. So we'll move on to uh, the sort of the follow-up to this paper, or the rather the follow-ups to this paper, which focus more on the theory. All right, so let me let me just uh, before uh, I show you the two papers uh, and show you some of the details in the two papers, let me just uh, try to tell you about the privacy uh, model that this inspired, and uh, we'll we'll maybe see some ideas of where we're going in terms of uh, the privacy guarantee. So let's let's draw out uh, you know what we had before. Um, so let's let's draw LDP over here. So LDP has uh, some data set, uh, you know, x1, x2, all the way down to xn. And the idea is, you know, here's where the trust barrier is, where uh, essentially the adversary can see anything on this side. And here is the curator. And the idea is each individual will send a privatized version of it, uh, say like something like this, y1, and then y2, and then yn. These are all sort of privatizations, and then they send this to the curator. So this is the LDP model. And I just want to distinguish this. Uh, OK, just for the sake of completeness, maybe this is all obvious to all of you. Uh, so this is the trust barrier for local differential privacy. Um, and we'll just write out what the central differential privacy looks like. That would be roughly the, uh, yeah, in fact, let me just uh, draw this again, actually, because this is going to be too different. But basically, yeah, I mean, you already know this, x1, x2, all the way up to xn. Then these all feed into the curator. And the trust barrier lies over here. Uh, they release some private statistic, z. OK, now let me distinguish. Uh, if I had to pick a picture that uh, shuffled uh, privacy, shuffled differential privacy looks more like, it's more like something like this. But uh, yeah, let me shrink this. just to leave this up here. Um, but what shuffled uh, differential privacy will look something kind of like the following. We're going to have the individual uh, data points, x1, x2, all the way to xn. Then these will be, say, somehow privatized by the users. And then these will be fed into a uh, shuffler. Let's make this shuffler. And the idea is that what comes out of this shuffler will be a permutation uniformly at random of, uh, of the data set. Let me just draw where the trust barrier is before. It's going to be right here. So this you'll have, say, uh, I don't know how to denote this, but y1 tilde. Um, and then we have y2 tilde, and then all the way up to yn tilde. And these are going to be like a uniformly random permutation of y, where y is y1 through yn. And these are now fed into the, uh, fed into the curator. 
So you can see it's kind of similar looking to so this what's known as shuffle DP. So you can see that this is kind of similar to LDP in the sense that each individual will noise their own data. You might be wondering, why does it actually make a difference? Well, the kind of punchline to give it away is the fact that uh, you know, LDP required each user to add uh, a lot of noise to their own data point. You know, that's what results in a lot of error. Whereas, uh, on the other hand, uh, this will say that a user can actually add just a little bit of noise, as long, or significantly less noise at least, as long as it's fed into the shuffler, um, then the resulting view that the, an adversary would have of this y1 through yn tilde after the shuffling, well, that would result in, uh, that, that would be a much more private. It's, it's going to be much more private, which is somehow amplified by the shuffler. And just sort of to, like, uh, since I use the word, let me mention this. Um, I mentioned, I said that the privacy will be amplified. We've already seen amplification by subsampling. This is uh, amplification by shuffling. There's a lot of different ways to amplify privacy, and this is kind of a very cool one, in my opinion. So, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's see some of the results of what we can prove in uh, this setting. So there were kind of two papers which were roughly simultaneous, which sort of introduced the uh, um, privacy standpoint, or sorry, the, introduced the theory, the theoretical model, which was sort of inspired by Proclo. Um, and which one should we talk about first? Uh, let's talk about this sort of general result. Uh, this is a very nice paper by, uh, uh, no, not this one. going on? This is not the paper I'm looking for. This is the one I'm looking for. Yeah, so this nice paper by Erlingson, Feldman, Mirnov, Raghunathan, Talwar, and Thakurta. And this sort of gives a rather general purpose uh, thing kind of relating the strength of the local model, or sorry, with, of the shuffled model with uh, the strength of the, um, with the strength of the central model. That is, uh, very, very roughly speaking, like as the ab abstract suggests, any algorithm that satisfies uh, epsilon local differential privacy will satisfy epsilon over uh, square root n central differential privacy. So this means you get a type of square root n factor amplification in terms of the privacy guarantee, um, which is quite nice in my opinion. Uh, so yeah, let, let me show you, let's look at a theorem that they have and it'll see, it's, it's a quite a wordy, it's a bit of a wordy theorem to get things precisely correct, but uh, you'll see hopefully the type of amplification that they give, which I think is quite nice. Uh, where is it? Just kind of far down the document for their main theorem. Uh, yeah, this is it. This is actually not the one I wanted just because of the fact that this is an old uh, theorem. Let me, or sorry, this is an older version of their paper. Uh, let me bring it up. Sure, this is the one I'm looking for. Uh, cool. So the theorem that we're looking for is this one, uh, theorem seven right here. So this is kind of a rather wordy theorem, but let's see if we can uh, parse it. And you know, it, it shouldn't be too bad once you focus on the right things. So for a uh, domain D, let's let uh, an algorithm which is locally differentially private, uh, you know, be a sequence of algorithms such that essentially all, all you should take from this uh, first part is the fact that um, a, a LDP is a epsilon not differentially private. Uh, yeah, essentially for all uh, data that's actually given in, it's differentially private. And then uh, 
it's saying that let ASL be an algorithm which essentially shuffles in the sort of setting that we saw before. So what it does is it sample that given a data set, it's going to sample a uniformly random permutation over n, then it will compute uh, the locally differential, the LDP sort of algorithm on the data, and then it'll output uh, you know, the result z1 through n. So the idea is all it does is it composes uh, at, at a high level, you know, you can you can think about what is this actually doing step by step. But the main thing you're trying to get um, that they're trying to get across here is uh, you essentially run the algorithm. Uh, you sorry, you run this locally differentially private algorithm, which is guaranteed to be epsilon uh, epsilon zero uh, differentially private, uh, locally differentially private and you should sort of run it on a shuffled thing, then the output is, this is sort of like the punchline, the output of the algorithm will satisfy epsilon delta differential privacy in the central model, where epsilon is this crazy expression here for epsilon one equals this. So that again is a bit of a mouthful, but okay, the main thing that I want you to take across is this last uh, sentence here, or the last fragment of the sentence here. Suppose you have n being sufficiently large, and importantly, this is this one is this is just like pick a big number, however big you want the data set. But importantly, suppose that your LDP algorithm that you ran on uh, sort of each individual uh, that you, that you had each user run on their thing, then if you have each thing being less than say one half differentially pro LDP, then the epsilon overall is going to be that epsilon times one over square root uh, n. So you can see that essentially what we managed to do is we managed to take the uh, differential privacy guarantee and divide it by a factor of square root n. So this is a very general purpose result, which is rather powerful because you know pretty much any LDP algorithm that you want, uh, it'll, it'll be able to strengthen those privacy guarantees by a factor of root n. So this is nice and it's very general purpose, but the downside is that this is actually not super useful in a lot of settings, just because of the fact that uh, you needed your epsilon naught to be a very strong uh, notion of privacy already, in the sense that, okay, so if you had epsilon naught equal to like one half or one quarter or something, then you can boost it to one quarter over square root n. But the thing is, you'd rarely want uh, privacy, which is much stronger than uh, you know, one uh, one quarter. Uh, in particular, maybe the right thing you would want is that uh, plugging in this formula. If you had epsilon not being square root n, then you could divide it by square root n, cancel it out, and get sort of a constant epsilon, which is often what you want. But the thing is, their theorem statement doesn't support that. So while it's useful in some cases showing this types of amplification. Uh, it's not necessarily going to apply in some cases of practical interest. So this still leaves, it, it's not like, while this is a very general statement, it doesn't solve the entire field in some sense. So let's see, the, let me show the other paper by um, another set of authors, um, which was at roughly the same time. And this one, uh, yeah, this one is by, let's go to the top. This one is by Chu, Smith, Ullman, Zever, and Ziliaev. And this also stu uh, studies the shuffle model, except it studies kind of, rather than trying the other, the other paper gives a very general result about uh, this type of amplification by shuffling. But this one uh, kind of focuses more on sort of very simple tasks and tries to uh, really get the right answer for them. Uh, in particular, they can show, you know, privacy amplification for uh, larger values of epsilon not than uh, a constant, which will actually let it lead to it being sort of um, more practically effective in certain cases. So let's see uh, what I want to say. Uh, yeah, they're kind of just giving some background here, and they're saying that. Uh, if you want to uh, estimate the sum of bits, 
uh, where one is held by each player, then this requires square root n over epsilon error in the local model, while an error of just o of one over epsilon is possible in the central model. Let's uh, let, I'll, I'll just you know let's spend a little bit of time on this just to see where what, where these numbers come from. So let's I'll just write this in red over it. Let's see if this is readable. So no, that's not readable. Um, let me insert a new page here. Uh, can I insert a new page here? Nope, not sure where these pages are. All right, uh, check the second page maybe? No, uh, we'll just write in the margins, I guess. Um, so let's see, if, suppose we're in the central model and you want to sum a bunch of bits. So you have that uh, summation of xi, where xi is in 0, 1. Well, what you would want to do is just add Laplace uh, 1 over epsilon noise, essentially. So the error that this incurs is just the magnitude of uh, this variable here, which is approximately equal to 1 over epsilon error. Now, the difference is if you wanted to uh, if you wanted to do it in the local model, LDP, then what instead you would have to do is summation of xi. I mean, you can use a randomized response, but another thing you can do is use the Laplace mechanism again, 1 over epsilon. And now the error is equal to the sum of these Laplaces. And so naively, you might think, OK, this is going to be n over epsilon error, because each of these is going to be about 1 over epsilon. But uh, kind of the nice thing, like uh, you know, just if you uh, look at what, oh, OK, I'll do the, you know, I'll do the error calculation for you. So uh, you know, the variance of summation of Laplace 1 over epsilons is equal to, just using uh, the fact that these are independent random variables, the sum of the variances of uh, Laplace 1 over epsilon, uh, where this is going to, since these are sort of IID, this is going to be n times the variance of each individual one, and the variance of each individual one is going to be 1 over epsilon squared. And since uh, you know, this is the variance of the overall thing, then the standard deviation of uh, this, uh, the error random variable is going to be approximately equal to square root n over epsilon. Um, and this is seen by Chebyshev or any of the usual tricks that we use. Um, but yeah, the point I'm trying to get across, even if you didn't follow that, is the fact that uh, in the central model, it's very easy to get uh, 1 over epsilon error. But in fact, the best you can do in the local differentially private uh, setting is going to be uh, square root n over epsilon. So just thinking back to the last result we saw, really you'd like to sort of scale out this uh, square root n factor uh, here to just get this 1 over epsilon, ideally. Um, yeah, this can be quite a significant factor in many cases. So yeah, they focus very much on this type of uh, this task, uh, just sort of summing bits, as well as uh, I think they also have algorithms for uh, summing real numbers. But yeah, let's just focus on kind of the summing bits just, just to keep it simple and so you can see uh, what type of uh, algorithms you have here. So uh, yeah, here's their sort of main theorem for when you're just in that setting where you're summing bits. There's an uh, algorithm in the shuffle model, which is epsilon differentially private. Uh, and you know the error is of order 1 over epsilon and ignore the log factors because I don't care about that too much. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the point is that in the shuffled model, this gives an error uh, which is approximately equal to 1 over epsilon, which is closer to the uh, central model than it is to the uh, local model, which had the square root n factor. OK, so how does, this, uh, how does their protocol work? We're not going to get too much into details, 
but um, you can just see how they sort of summarize it here. It's kind of like a randomized response type uh, algorithm, where you know essentially each what what would we do in randomized response in the local model? Um, you know, with LDP randomized response, we'd have something like uh, one half uh, plus gamma, or let, let's be be honest, like one one it'll be one half plus epsilon. Uh, probability of telling the truth versus one half minus epsilon probability of lying. So that's what uh, would give you local differential privacy. Here they use a sort of much uh, weaker, uh, much stronger, I don't know, they're much more likely to tell the truth, uh, I guess is how I want to say it. So they say, for example, when epsilon is not too small, then it's roughly going to be something like this, um, you know, shuffle differential privacy. Uh, randomized response, where with probability roughly 1 minus 1 over epsilon squared n, you tell the truth. And with probability 1 over epsilon squared times n, you tell a lie. So you can see that if n is, you know, pretty big or epsilon is not too small, like imagine epsilon being something like 1, then you can see that uh, this, with overwhelming probability, uh, each individual tells the truth, but then a small number will lie uniformly at random. So this is much different from the randomized response setting in the local model, where each user would instead, you know, flip a coin essentially if they're going to tell the truth or not. Here, say almost everyone tells the truth in some sense. So. Yeah, of course, each individual person's uh, output will not be differentially private just because of the fact that they almost certainly told the truth. But once it goes to the shuffler, it's very nice in the sense that uh, it really gives a sort of deniability that sort of uh, we love about differential privacy. So I think this is, a vi this is a very nice result because it really lets you add much less noise, uh, significantly less noise uh, to the uh, to the you know private information and still get a differentially private solution. It it really, I think this entire body of work, which is very active, this line of work has seen a lot of um, papers and the and results in the last couple of years. Um, but it really shows the power of adding in this additional cryptographic primitive, um, or however you want to implement it, which uh, really, you know. Which, which really adds a lot of power and essentially is able to take, in many cases, the local model to the uh, central model's uh, error. So yeah, I can refer you to this paper or any of these papers or some of the more recent work uh, if you want to see more. So yeah, that's the first uh, deployment. And maybe I'm cheating. Uh, I told you about a deployment and we ended up looking at theory papers. Um, but I think it's a very exciting direction and I think it can see a lot of practical use because um, it gives, it, it's kind of, let, let me talk a little bit more from a deployment uh, standpoint. Really, local differential privacy is the type of privacy you would want to give in terms of like strong privacy to users. Um, you wouldn't want them to trust you with your data in the raw, but it really loses far too much accuracy. So this shows kind of one of the simpler things that you can do in order to uh, guarantee the users that, like a lot of privacy still, um, but get much better accuracy. In particular, uh, what, what you do in terms of what, at least even in the Proclo paper, what they did was things like, you know, uh, appropriate shuffling and removing uh, identifying data and stuff like that. Even heuristics like that are kind of more in line with what might be done in uh, industry practice nowadays in terms of uh, privacy for certain types of data. So like, um, doing this uh, type of shuffle differential privacy on top of that, it's kind of compatibility and kind of like a level up of that type of uh, uh, privacy protection. Okay, so that's uh, all I want to say for now about the shuffle model. Let's move on to other topics in uh, recent deployments. What will we talk about next? Um, yeah, let's talk about uh, which is LinkedIn one. Oh yeah, um, not this paper. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about some deployment. I don't know why it 
Der kommt auch in der KW, wie wir die gerade sind, auch nicht. Alright, uh, let's talk about a LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn's privacy solution, or differential privacy uh, system, which is further in audience engagements API. Uh, this audience engagements API is basically uh, something for trusted uh, advertisers. They can try to see uh, what the, their audience has really liked and what they've engaged with. So they, they give a sales pitch, um, no, being a company, maybe they have to, a sales pitch in sort of the first paragraph. It's a platform that enables marketers to get aggregated insights about members' contents engagement while also ensuring that member uh, user data is protected. So like, uh, yeah, they give an example, a user wants, to, an advertiser wants to do a sponsored posts and uh, they do research to find out how uh, their target audience engages with the type of article. So, uh, yeah, basically they, they can find out what their users uh, and what their target audience really likes, and so they can increase engagement by doing something like this. Um, and the thing is, of course, you wouldn't want to reveal what every single user is uh, doing at any given time. So instead, you have to do something while, which actually respects user privacy. And so that's where their system comes in uh, to prevent, to, to provide user privacy using differential privacy. Um, okay, so yeah, we'll talk a bit about this. There's, they, they, I don't want to get too much into detail here, but let me just sort of highlight some of the really interesting and important uh, sort of features of their um, algorithms. Their system is really nice. I think LinkedIn does some really cool stuff because a lot of their uh, work that went into their um, their systems here really came out of important theory work that they did in the same area. For example, let me uh, point out def definition 2.2. So definition 2.2 is kind of is a definition that is kind of like uh, differential privacy, but it's actually a little bit uh, better in certain cases. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can kind of glance at it here, but essentially, given a mechanism that takes a histogram over some uh, domain and to some set Y, then it's bounded range if essentially it satisfies something kind of like a, a you know, differential privacy. If you, if you just had like a one over on this right hand side, that would be uh, differential privacy. But if instead you have the product of the ratios of some outcomes under these two data sets, then this is what they call bounded range. Well, why, why, like, why, why would you introduce this sort of thing? Well, it's a little bit stronger than differential privacy in the sense that anything in that is bounded range is also differentially private, and anything that's differentially private is bounded range up to a factor of two. So you can see that this is very like closely related to differential privacy. You know, in fact, it's kind of equivalent if you don't care about the constants, but the thing is, in differential privacy, we often do care about the constants. Like imagine an algorithm which is, say, 5 dp versus 10 dp or something like that. Uh, if you can save a factor of 2 there, then that's, that's a huge amount of additional privacy, like a factor of e to the 5, essentially, uh, in terms of the probability of any outcome. So yeah, it turns out that this type of bounded range uh, property is a better way to uh, analyze algorithms. For example, the exponential mechanism, you can save uh, basically up to a factor of two, is my understanding, um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the type of privacy you'll get uh, from it. So yeah, as in the, the bounded range is sort of a theoretical thing, which uh, came out of sort of very, very rigorous theoretical analysis, but uh, it really gave, uh, gives much better accuracy overall, because you can save, sorry, for the same, you can prove, you, you can give the same uh, privacy guarantee, uh, but get much better accuracy uh, if you analyze it this way. Yeah, that's what I'll say. Um, so that's just one way. There's also other algorithms which have been introduced by other by researchers at LinkedIn, which are sort of useful for various settings. So like, they have this little um, table here, where they talk about the different settings in terms of uh, the sensitivity and 
unrestricted sensitivity where the domain is known and unknown. So let me just break this down uh, here and tell you like what, what these sort of different things mean. So known domain is, uh, yeah, essentially all their algorithms that they want to do here are some sort of histogram things or trying to um, output the uh, top K uh, of something, for example. Like, uh, I don't know, I'm terrible at making up stuff like this on the fly, but let's say we wanted to find out, uh, we had some histograms of uh, different values, say like, you know, what favorite ice creams or something. Uh, So say there's like vanilla. I don't know why LinkedIn would have this data. Chocolate and strawberry. Essentially, uh, the type of queries that you'd want to do is to try to find uh, which ones are the largest of these. So uh, yeah, essentially, you know, you privatize them. This goes up, and the privatization goes here. But you would like to find uh, which ones are going to be uh, the largest. You don't care about, say, all the outcomes necessarily. You just want to find which ones are the biggest. This could be natural. Say, if you're an advertiser and you want to find what topics your uh, target audience likes the most, then you don't really care about what their 12th most, fa uh, the thing that their 12th most interested in is. So all of these are kind of algorithms which are trying to find uh, trying to find which ones uh, are most popular. So this was a rather silly example, but hopefully that makes sense that uh, you know, you're know you just trying to find which things are most popular in a histogram. So I think the known domain versus the unknown domain should be uh, kind of obvious what, what we're talking about here. Like known domain is when you know, say, strawberry, uh, uh, vanilla, chocolate, different flavors or whatever. Unknown domain is where, say, you don't necessarily know all the different things you're looking at. Um, there might be more of them. Or there might just be, yeah, there, there could be more of them that you don't know, or you don't want to list all of them for like uh, other considerations. Now, uh, that's sort of what the, the sort of known domain versus unknown domain is. However, um, sensitivity is kind of uh, an, another thing. Uh, they have sort of two cases where we have delta restricted sensitivity versus unrestricted sensitivity. Well, what does that mean? That kind of means how many uh, things can uh, each person uh, co contribute to. For example, like uh, let me give a slightly different example. Um, you know, these are skills. Uh, so. This is one that's actually very relevant to uh, um, LinkedIn, as we'll sort of see in the next example. But yeah, suppose I was looking at uh, someone's skills in terms of uh, what programming languages they know. So let's say you want to know how many people know Java, how many people know Python, uh, and how many people know C++. And so maybe you have some numbers for this, for this, for this. The thing is, this isn't necessarily like uh, the sort of classic histogram case we've looked at, because it could be that one person knows all of these simultaneously. So, uh, you know, uh, for example, if I know all three of these languages, Java, Python, and C++, then my removal from the data set would be that, uh, you know, each of them decreases by one. Something like that. So this is different from uh, the typical like histogram analysis because what we did was uh, was you know we would just add noise and the, the analysis really depended on each individual only affecting one different thing. So that's kind of what's known as one restricted sensitivity before, where uh, an individual can only affect one of these uh, bins at once in the histogram. Uh, more generally, delta restricted sensitivity is when a addition or removal of a user can affect up to delta different uh, bins counts. Now, unrestricted sensitivity is when you don't have any such bound on delta or where delta might be large, let's say. And yeah, say if it would be the case if you're trying to know do what programming languages uh, someone knows. In the sort of worst case, so to speak, um, they could know all the programming languages, and then you'd have to 
be able to um, account for that. So those are sort of the four different cases where we could have either known or unknown domain, um, and the sensitivity is restricted in terms of the number of changes we can make, uh, bins we change, or versus unrestricted sensitivity. Uh, so the algorithms down here are actually some rather comparatively sophisticated algorithms which were introduced by LinkedIn researchers. Um, this one is called known lap, which is you know kind of an arcane name, but it's your favorite. Uh, it's, it's like your our beloved Laplace uh, mechanism, which just adds Laplace noise to each thing. Uh, it's slightly modified because of the fact that we have to um, deal with the fact that it's delta restricted sensitivity. So we just have to account for that by scaling up our noise by a delta factor essentially. But uh, you know this is just Laplace mechanism. Uh, and this one is kind of weird. Um, you know, this might not sound familiar to you at all. Known GUMB, well, known GUMB is short for known GUMBL distribution. Um, and this is a very fancy way of saying uh, the exponential mechanism plus what's known as peeling. By that, uh, Suppose you know we had a whole bunch of uh, programming languages. Uh, yeah, suppose there were even more, like say uh, 50 of them. I don't know. Um, but we only wanted to find, say, the say uh, two most popular. Let's let's suppose all the other ones are down here or something. I I, I don't. Uh, they're not going to be relevant to our example. But suppose you know the most popular one is Java and then Python and so on. So how might we be able to find these by uh, the exponential mechanism? Well, what we could do is essentially, uh, you know, what we could do is do the exponential mechanism on all of these, trying to find, OK, which one has the most. Notice that on neighboring data sets, uh, essentially, OK, let, let me sort of be a bit more precise because uh, it might be a while. but. Uh, what the exponential mechanism would do it would define objects, that is, the different objects would be the different programming languages, and it would define a score for each object with respect to the data set, and that would be essentially exactly the count of how many people know that uh, language. We'll note that the score of any individual one, uh, any individual object, would only change by, uh, at most, one. So therefore, it's a really a sensitivity one uh, query. So what you could do is just run the exponential mechanism to find whichever was the most popular. Say, in this case, maybe it would be Java. It could be something else if uh, the noise has its way. But so you first see that uh, Java is the most popular. OK, so good. And peeling is then going to suppose, but I said that you don't just want to know the first most popular one. You want to know the two most popular ones. So with the peeling, uh, there's not really a mechanism, but the peeling, as it's generally called, is you know, you take the first one most popular, and then you just uh, run the exponential mechanism recursively on everything else. So now, then for the second one, you'd see if you run the exponential mechanism again, you'd see that Python is the most popular. And then maybe we only cared about two, so you'd stop here. But uh, yeah, that's kind of how you would find, say, the uh, k most popular ones if you uh, by using the exponential mechanism. Now, the last thing I want to comment on here, which is kind of an important, uh, a neat technical fact about uh, the exponential mechanism, is how to actually implement it. Uh, I mean, the way we've always been talking about the exponential mechanism is that uh, you, know, you do the exponential mechanism by defining the scores, and then you select each one proportional to, uh, you know, proportional to, what is it? It's score times delta over epsilon, uh, something like that. Now, this is kind of weird, and you have to sort of define a distribution of all these things, and it's not even clear how to sample from that distribution. But it turns out that there's a, a very simple way to uh, e uh, express that type of algorithm. So let me just show it to you here. Uh, yeah, what's the, what's the simplest way to? Uh, Say this like if if they do a bit more here because they're uh, like outputting the counts. But let me let me just simplify this algorithm a little bit. Um, no, I guess I guess let's leave it like this. Uh, 
let's just say you want to just output the most popular item and you want to output its count. Well, the thing you can do is rather than doing this, you know, as we, you know, define and you select things with probability proportional to, uh, you know, whatever the score is, which we'll call hi, divided by epsilon, times the delta. Well, this is kind of weird because we don't know how to sample from a distribution like this. Instead, what you can do is, this is a very neat trick, it's called the Gumbel max trick. Instead of doing this thing where you sample proportional to uh, this, instead what you can do is you can instead uh, take the score of whatever the items are, you add a new type of noise distribution called gumbel noise, and then, uh, I guess I should have said what I... Yeah, I, I guess, okay, like, uh, this isn't exactly it. But basically, what you're going to do is you're going to add gumbel noise onto each score, and then what you do is you return whichever one is the max. Uh, so max over uh, i, I guess maybe, yeah, the arg max of this. And this will essentially, I, I claim that if you do this and you return the uh, index corresponding to uh, whichever one has the highest uh, score after adding this gumbel noise, then this is exactly equivalent to the exponential mechanism. Um, yeah, so this is very convenient because like I said, it's not clear how to sample from a distribution like this. It's kind of weird and you have to compute the normalizing factor. It can be kind of awkward sometimes. But a very quick and easy way to do it is just to add gumbel noise and take the max one. It's, it's much easier to implement. Uh, you won't deal with any sort of numerical issues comparatively. Yeah. Another reason why this is convenient is because remember what we were describing before, um, where we wanted to do this peeling, where we would take the, run the exponential mechanism, take the one with the lar largest uh, whatever it outputs, and then you recursively run it again. Well, the really neat thing here is that uh, erase all of this. The neat thing is that due to certain properties of uh, exponential, even due to properties of exponential noise, I guess I just want to say that all you need to do is add gumbel noise to all of them once, and then uh, you can just output, if you want to output the top several of them, say the out, you want to output the top k, what you can do is just add this gumbel noise once to all of them and then output the top k noisiest, uh, highest scores after being noised. Essentially, this is like, uh, instead of taking, say, uh, if you wanted to peel off k things, the, you know, the naive way of doing it, the peeling method would take k times n time, essentially, or uh, let's say k times d time, if there's k, uh, if there's d different items. Yeah, d is the number of items, k is the number of things you want to output. Naively, you'd have to do it uh, k, take k times d time, but this lets you just add noise once, takes order d time, and then you just pick the top uh, k things, which is what you return, so basically order d. So it saves you a factor of k in the running time by doing this sort of trick. Okay, so this is this was kind of an aside, but I think it's a very useful thing to know, the fact that you know the exponential mechanism can be done using what's known as uh, the Gumbel max trick and this peeling mechanism as well. Um, those are both good to know. Uh, right, the point is that what they do is they've built up a sort of arsenal of different algorithms which are all useful for uh, slightly different settings and these are the ones they apply. Let's, we'll talk a bit about what they apply them for. We already talked about uh, some of them, like you know how an advertiser would target different uh, uh, audience uh, sort of demographics, or in terms of their interests. Uh, let's see a little bit more about their, uh, their um, deployment details, some other things which I found were kind of interesting. What's this? Yeah, and like I said, they do their analysis using this bounded uh, range type of notion, which they actually, which LinkedIn researchers introduced, which I think is kind of cool, like doing new theory in order to uh, 
you know, improve your system, I think is a very nice idea and something which is sort of intrinsic to differential privacy. Um, yeah, one thing I think is kind of interesting is there's a unique, remember that all the previous deployments we've really talked about uh, have been to do with local differential privacy, but this is a central differential privacy uh, setting. And also we're in a setting where, uh, this, this is a really unique thing about this, where the external users are the ones who choose the queries. This is challenging because, uh, yeah, because you know maybe the users are uh, malicious. Maybe they could work together and stuff like that. Um, so this is really something you have to be uh, concerned with. You know, at least within say with, for rapport, which was in within Google, for that sort of thing, you know maybe you can trust that your uh, engineers or they they kind of know the implication. They're not going to do anything bad. But when you kind of open it up, then it's then it's a bit more challenging. In particular, the really uh, crucial thing here is the fact that maybe all your different advertisers want different uh, answers to different queries. So for example, um, one, one thing you could have done is just say, here are the query results we can give you, and these are protected via differential privacy. But the thing is here that the advertisers, they might have different needs in terms of the type of queries they want to ask. So the kind of core question is, how do you handle this and while still respecting differential privacy? Uh, for example, you know, advertiser one could have a set of queries that they want to ask about the data, and then advertiser two has a totally disjoint set of queries that they want to ask. Well, the way they get around that is a sort of non-technical solution. Um, essentially, the, the idea is, oh, okay, one fear that you could have is that uh, there's say advertiser uh, one who has you know gets like some disclosures which are say epsilon DP and then advertiser two they get another set of disclosures which are combined epsilon DP and now if they collude you know they put our, their stuff together then overall they have done a release which is two epsilon DP uh, about the users. Now, this of course is bad, but kind of what's assumed here in the LinkedIn system is that advertisers do not collude. Uh, you know, they aren't going to share information with each other uh, of the results of these queries. And you know, you might wonder, is this a good solution or not? Well, it's kind of the one that you have to do in order to protect uh, the user data here, because I, I can't, at least I can't see, and I guess they couldn't see any other good way of uh, preventing this. Um, of course, it's not like they just let any advertiser in. There's like a vetting process where, you know, to be able to get access even to the sensitive data when being privatized, you have to pass a vetting process, which I assume involves you agreeing that you won't share any of this data with anyone else. So, yeah, essentially they do have protections by, by sort of non-technical solutions in terms of having a vetting process to make sure people don't collude. So I think that's kind of interesting because this is unique in terms of the deployments. Uh, you know, you have external uh, users who are asking questions, which is sort of unique uh, compared to the other things we've done. Uh, one last interesting thing in our, like, th this is, I think, a very interesting investigation they do here, in that they determine what sort of parameters are appropriately private. Uh, and they do a very sort of principled way of exploring and determining what sort of parameters are uh, they should pick and how much disclosure they should have. And they kind of uh, choose these values based on certain types of attacks that they think an analyst might do. I say these are the attacks, but they don't necessarily have to be even malicious. It might just be something accidentally that a, uh, an analyst would do. So they sort of describe a type of attack that might come up, and then they, deter they derive from that an epsilon value, which they think is reasonable pre to, pre to prevent that type of attack from happening. And they come up with a bunch of different things like this, you know, how to determine delta, a call budget, whatever that means, and so on. And that allows them to come up with the following values here, which I think is an interesting comparison, which, um, you know, if you take it at face value, it seems like very, uh, compelling for them compared to uh, other advertisers. 
like if you take a look, you know, they set the parameters as 0 0.15 um, and they're allowed a certain number of queries overall, which corresponds to a monthly epsilon delta DP uh, guarantee of this. And it, if you compare that with all of these other uh, previous things that we talked about, um, you know, this is rapport, here's the Apple deployments, the Microsoft telemetry uh, thing. Um, you can see that these actually all have quite a bit higher differential privacy guarantees when it comes to the guarantees you, like the amount of privacy loss over a month. So it's kind of cool that they're able to have uh, such strong privacy guarantees, though of course these are all in vastly different domains, uh, so it probably takes a bit more comparison than just like reading it at face value. So, but I, I think it's an interesting comparison to see like to see these numbers, just to have them all in one place. Um, okay, and let me show you one more thing which I think is really interesting with respect to this LinkedIn uh, deployment, just in terms of uh, what else they've used this for. Um, so here is another thing they've used, a similar type of differential uh, privacy uh, sort of system, the same type of system and same type of algorithm in order to determine uh, which, uh, you know, get insights about what type of jobs have become more and less popular over the last uh, few months. So for example, let's say what region, industry, and time frame are you interested in? Let's say I'm interested in jobs in Canada. Um, yeah, let's just say in Ontario even. For the time frame, uh, three months ending October 2020. And let's just say all industries. So this tells you who's hiring. Uh, yeah, who are the top trending employers? This is actually kind of little, um, that we can get some more information if we just say all available regions. So yeah, you can see which, uh, who's hiring and uh, how these compare with previous things. So you can see the top trending employers. Um, so for example, you can see Centrix is the most popular. Um, interestingly, University of Waterloo is one of the top trending employers as well, uh, showing that there's been a lot of growth in the recent hires for the last few months. Um, it tells you also what jobs are most popular. Software engineers seem to be the most uh, uh, popular one in terms of the percent of recent hires um, within Canada. And the skills are needed uh, are sort of listed here. Um, and all of this is released via differential privacy in a differentially private manner. So this is kind of cool, and they have a separate uh, paper which they describe this. Um, in the interest of time, we're not going to really get into that. Uh, but let me just show you what the paper looks like. Yeah, a member's first approach to enabling LinkedIn's labor market insights at scale. So essentially, this is just sort of a description of what's going on behind the scenes of that uh, paper. And you can see they, they kind of describe their algorithms. And I guess, what do I want to mention? I'll just mention the fact that they use these, like, uh, in terms of the algorithm they used, they used this uh, delta restricted sensitivity algorithm for the first two. So remember, this is like, uh, this is going to be, uh, what do I want to say? This is going to be just um, the type of things where a, a single event can only affect a single outcome. For example, when a user, essentially each event here is going to be a user getting hired off of LinkedIn. Well, uh, when, you, when you get hired, then you change exactly one employer by one. So that's sort of why, uh, and you take exactly one job and increment it by one. So you can see that both of these are the types of things that would uh, that would only affect a single thing, and that's why we would use one restricted sensitivity um, for those two things. But then I chose a very specific example earlier when talking about unrestricted sensitivity, where uh, you know I talked about the skills that you would have. So you can see here they also rank which skills are needed, and you could imagine that. Uh, an individual could potentially, an individual who's hired could actually have all of these uh, skills at the same time. That would be quite a talented individual, but um, 
Yeah, so for the first two examples, they have to use one of their algorithms for bounded sensitivity, and this one they have to use the unbounded sensitivity algorithm. And they discuss a few other sort of design choices in here. Um, yeah, at varying levels of detail. So yeah, this is a nice short paper, which is uh, you know interesting and uh, could be of interest to see you know what sort of design choices and how they actually execute this. So that's it for linked coverage of LinkedIn. Uh, we'll talk very briefly about two more uh, types of deployments of. Uh, uh, differential privacy. This one has been very, this is a very recent one, um, but it's kind of, I think, very interesting and timely. So Google has released what are known as COVID-19 community mobility reports. So in these mobility reports, uh, they essentially discuss and describe where people have visited um, based on mobile phone data. I think this is an opt-in mobile phone data um, in terms of what areas have gotten more popular and less popular compared to the pre-COVID era, which now seems like a distant memory, but say like January, February, that type of time of the year. So that's the baseline, and you can see that um, retail and recreation, people are currently going uh, to these areas 34% less than the baseline, stuff like that. Grocery and pharmacy are down somewhat, but not as much. Parks are currently, you know, I would expect significantly down, uh, kind of it's in the middle of the winter. For some reason, it's not as, I, I, yeah, it's unclear to me why uh, it's so spiky here. But another one which is perhaps more explainable is, say, for example, transit stations and workplaces, I think, is a really interesting one. Uh, what are these peaks? Well, you can imagine what this means is, uh, on weekdays, every weekday, uh, the compared to the baseline, people are staying home a lot more, so people don't go to their workplace as much. However, on weekends, you can see that uh, there's no change compared to the baseline because people are at home now, while well, they would have been home on the weekends anyway, or they wouldn't be at their workplace. And similarly, you know, as you might expect, residential time at residence is up to 17% because people are at home a lot more. So this is kind of what they've, uh, and they, this is, uh, yeah, this is Ontario data. So this is all for various different uh, counties and regions. If you're curious, you can find uh, Waterloo somewhere around here, right down here, um, and how it compares to other places. Yeah, but all of this data is, uh, you know, this is quite comprehensive data. It's very interesting to try to understand how human behavior has changed. And this is enabled by uh, differential privacy in the sense that they also have a white paper on this, which uh, kind of describes how they do it and some of the design choices that they make. It's a fairly short document with quite a few authors, actually. Um, yeah, you can read this if you're interested. They talk about some of the design choices they make, uh, you know, what their values of epsilon are and how they come up with those, uh, some sort of heuristics and other things they do, for example, like, uh, Instead of leaking if a person visits a lot of places, then they'll drop some of them at random so that uh, it bounds the uh, contribution. Kind of similar to some of the stuff in the um, unbounded contributions in the LinkedIn uh, deployment we saw just before. Uh, other things are other heuristics and ways of making sure that there's additional privacy protections. For example, shrinking areas which are too small because that could be location identifying. So yeah, this is kind of cool and uh, it's worth checking out if you're curious about uh, some of the things that went into this. The final deployment that I'll mention today is uh, a very interesting data release by, oh, for some reason, let me open this again. A very interesting release by Facebook, uh, kind of Facebook in collaboration with an organization known as Social Science One, which is actually perhaps one of the biggest data releases you know of all time. Uh, un unclear whether it's true, but but definitely the biggest uh, data release uh, ever with uh, differential privacy. So essentially, what this does is a uh, yeah, like a, it, it's, it was a release of a data set which 
isn't open to everyone in the world. You can't just like not any and not everyone can just view this freely online. But you have to um, put in a request for uh, an RFP, as it's called, uh, in order to gain yeah request for proposals. Um, if you want to gain access to it, but. Uh, it essentially releases information about a huge amount of uh, activity on Facebook in terms of uh, which web URLs were interacted with by which people. And they give an example of the scale of this data. Um, so they process roughly an exabyte of raw data from the Facebook platform, 50 terabytes per day of interaction metrics, and more than one petabyte per day of exposure data in terms of view. So this is like really, really big data. It's a data set involving 38 million URLs, more than 700 billion rows, and 17 trillion like cell values, so sort of uh, cell entries, yeah. So let me just roughly point you towards what it is. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to get into all the details of what how they did this, but like just to show you a picture of what exactly the data set is, there's going to be uh, essentially what what the data set tries to capture is all activity in terms of users uh, interacting with URLs on Facebook. So for example, a single event could be that um, a user uh, who is from DE, which is uh, Deutschland, Germany, between ages 35 and 44, who's female, uh, I don't know what this field is, but they essentially at uh, this timestamp that user one liked URL one. So essentially says that, you know, I don't know, your grandma, not, not your grandma, maybe that would be too old, but your, your relative who lives in Germany, who's a woman, um, a female rather, um, they accessed this certain URL and they clicked like on it at this time. Uh, and then there's so on and so on in terms of all the user activity. This is of course highly sensitive data, you know, if some, you wouldn't want it to be revealed all the sorts of like uh, Facebook uh, URLs that you liked or clicked or shared. So uh, what they do is essentially group this and sort of aggregate it and privatize accounts. So for example, based on this huge amount of data that you have here, then they aggregate it saying that, um, okay, this URL, whatever the URL one is, um, on in this month, and if you consider users who are within this demographic, say German, age 35 to 44, female, um, null for this parameter, I'm not sure what it is, uh, then the number of those people uh, who accessed this link and viewed this link, 548 of them viewed that link. The number who clicked that link are 44. The number who shared are minus four, uh, okay. And the number who liked are 68 and so on. So essentially a data set in terms of how many people from this whatever demographic access the link in whatever ways we have here in these columns. You'll notice, of course, that we have this minus four. You can probably guess at this point, I hope you can guess by this point, is because this has been privatized. Essentially all these demographics are, sorry, not the demographics, the demographics are sort of preserved and uh, joined on. Um, but what's been uh, privatized is how many of them really uh, really uh, did whatever act action. And so they have this huge breakdown table which will contain that for all the URLs. And then there's the URL attribute table which sort of says, okay, URL one, what exactly is URL one? Well, it's going to be this actual website. So yeah, this is a massive data set of this type of, uh, of this type of information, which could be very useful in terms of for social scientists in order, order to understand uh, users' behavior on Facebook. So there's a there's a long document that kind of describes what's going on here. Um, there's not too much else I want to say here. There's a few. Oh, okay, there's two more points I think I want to get at. One is that this is actually protected using a uh, notion of privacy, which is actually fairly recent, uh, called um, zero concentrate differential privacy. Um, I feel like they should have also mentioned zero concentrate differential privacy is by uh, Bunn and Steinke. It comes out of concentrated differential privacy, which was uh, sort of previously introduced by Dwork and Rothblum. Um, so it's kind of a comparatively new notion of differential privacy, which lives between pure and approximate differential privacy. But the nice thing is that you know it only has one parameter rather than epsilon. 
Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Don't worry about it too much, but let me just say that it's nicer than approximate differential privacy since it only has one parameter rather than epsilon and delta. It has just a single parameter rho. Um, but unlike uh, unlike uh, pure differential privacy, which has this uh, you know additive composition in the sense like if you do k queries, you get epsilon times k differential privacy. Well, with concentrated di differential privacy, you essentially get uh, the advanced composition by multiplying by a factor of square root k, essentially. But don't worry too much about that. The point is it's sort of a rather contemporary, uh, relatively new notion of differential privacy, which is kind of cool that they adopted this. Um, and I also want to mention how they talked about how they came up with their uh, privacy budget, which is kind of neat in the sense that there is two types of privacy that you could think are natural here. One is user level privacy and one is action level privacy. So what do I mean by that? Um, this is again related to the same thing we've talked about a few different uh, times. How many different like pieces of data does the user contribute to the data set? Is it just one or is it many? Well, uh, yeah, the idea is, you know, do you want it to be privatized at the level of one action being uh, the sort of piece of data? So, for example, each link click you do, do you want that to be private? Or do you want it to be that all of a user's actions overall are private? Uh, and the thing is, it's, not, it's, it's kind of hard to be able to control both of these simultaneously. In the sense, or rather, OK, ideally what we would want is user level differential privacy, where you know, adding or removing a single uh, user would kind of hide all of their activity, everything. But the thing is, that's, uh, that's too much to ask for in this type of setting because of the fact that uh, if you have some super user who you know, views everything, clicks everything, likes everything, uh, reacts on absolutely everything, this would be too much data that they're contributing. So instead, what they do is offer uh, per action differential privacy. Uh, but the thing is, they offer such a strong per action uh, level of differential privacy that 99% of users are protected with user level differential privacy. So in other words, for example, uh, let's, let's look at clicks, not views. But um, you know, each individual click is protected with uh, 0.1 uh, differential privacy, let's say. And that results in, since the sort of um, 99th percentile of users clicks 17 or fewer links, uh, therefore, if you use the sort of composition in the right way, that implies uh, that overall that they enjoy 0 0.45 uh, differential privacy as their parameter. So you can see that uh, the kind of guarantee they go for is 99% of users are guaranteed uh, epsilon equals 0 0.45 differential privacy. Um, and then each individual action Sorry, each, say 99% are guaranteed this, but each action is given this much stronger privacy, especially for each view, which is given 0, 0.00 differential privacy. So just sort of to, to at, a, at a high level, I like this because it, it kind of uh, quantifies, it, it gets around the fact that it can be kind of difficult to provide equivalent privacy protections to uh, like a heterogeneous set of users. But uh, you know, sometimes you have to compromise by saying that you, know, you give strong protection to almost all of the users. And beyond that, you give uh, you know, a per action uh, level of privacy to everyone else. So yeah, we have some more stuff. Something about the URL sanitization. How do you, like, you know, maybe people are clicking some crazy links with a lot of stuff on it. How do you? Uh, do what it actually, uh, what, how do you deduplicate that and stuff like that. So that's totally unrelated to differential privacy. Um, but still kind of interesting. Some more documentation here. So yeah, this and the last one, the Google COVID thing, are both examples of sort of data releases, uh, invo like sort of data sets released using differential privacy rather than sort of query systems. So yeah, that sort of concludes uh, this uh, class on uh, you know deployments. There's, of course, other deployments which I haven't been able to get to, uh, at least yet. For example, there's a system known as uh, 
uh, Psi, PSI, which you can check out. And of course, sort of the, the very big and interesting one, which would take at least an entire lecture to cover, is uh, the Census Bureau's deployment of differential privacy. But um, that's all we have time for during today's lecture, so I'm going to cut it called quits. Thanks for joining.